Okay, recording is on. Let's take a moment just to uh, pray together, and um, then we will start our class. Um, may I request somebody to please pray, and we'll start. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the class we are about to have, Lord. God, I give each and every one of my classmates who have gathered here into your hands, Jesus. We are here to listen to your words. We are here to understand more about you, to get deeper in our knowledge about you, to, to know more and more about you, Jesus, as Pastor Ashish teaches us. Help us to uh, listen to you carefully, God. I pray for a good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session, Jesus, and let there be no hindrance in the name of Jesus, God. And I pray for everyone who's on the way to connect, God. If you can good Wi-Fi connection, I pray that everyone will be gathered here today and we will know more about you, Jesus. Throughout the class, you'll be the Alpha and the Omega, Jesus. You'll be the first and the last, and uh, as Pastor teaches us, help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it and understand each and every word that he is saying, Jesus. Be with us, Lord, and guide us. In Jesus' name, of you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. So we come down to the uh, final session, or I should say final topic in this course on Christian apologetics, just to kind of review this journey that we've made. Um, we began this course by um, uh, just defining or ex explaining what Christian apologetics is and um, looking at how both the Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul uh, took time to reason with people. You know, Jesus answered the questions people came to him with. Sometimes, of course, people came to him with trick questions, maybe intending to get him into trouble. And sometimes people came with genuine questions. And uh, he took time to respond to that. And then, same thing with the Apostle Paul in his ministry. Uh, he reasoned with people. You know, as he went from place to place, he took time to reason. He took time to explain. So we gave that background, and then we journeyed first of all in the first section, which was a little heavy on science. Uh, we talked about creation uh, and create the, the uh, evidence of a creator and things around creation. You know, uh, the two main theories from science on um, cosmology and also on uh, evolutionary. Uh, process. So we try to respond to that. So that was the first part of the course. Then we changed, we moved into talking about the person of Christ himself. Oh, sorry, we, we spent once, uh, next topic was on the Bible, on how we got the Bible, why we believe the Bible is true or reliable or authentic. Spent time on that. Then we spent time on the uh, on the person of Christ, uh, the uniqueness of Christ, why he's complete uh, in terms of uh, salvation through Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of Christ, and how do we share Christ meaningfully to people of other faith, especially Hindu, Hindus and Muslims, two major world religions. So we took time on that. We uh, went through that. Then we began to talk about some other matters where uh, we moved into talking about suffering, which is a big, big question in the minds of many people. You know, why is there suffering? Why is there evil in this world? And so on. So we went through that part, uh, discussing on that, which is a big thing, a uh, big area uh, where people have questions and so on. And now we come down to the final part of our uh, learning on Christian apologetics, which is on social issues. Um, the questions that people have on 
different social issues. I mean, there are a lot of you know issues, especially today when you look around in the world. Um, lots and lots of things people are <laughs> arguing over, fighting over social matters. And uh, in many ways, you know, the the church has to have its position. You know, what does the church say? What do believers say? What does the Bible say about this matter? And so we want to try and address some of the, you know, maybe the more important uh, social issues, questions, topics, and try to give a uh, an answer to some of these. Uh, what I, what we want to do is we want to first of all establish some sort of a framework, meaning uh, this is how we should think in trying to respond to social issues. Now we may not be able to cover all the social issues that are there. Now we'll pick up we'll pick some of the important ones, but then there may be some new new topics that come, say you know uh, next year or a year from now, a few years from now, some other topic becomes a big issue. Uh, uh, either you know regionally or sometimes globally, but if you have a framework and say, okay, you know, whatever the matter is, this is how we should think about it from a biblical perspective. Then we can arrive at our decisions or answers using that framework. So that's what I I want to do first, and then we will pick up some topics, and uh, you know, and if you have additional questions, uh, we can also do that. So let's see how far we go today. Uh, we may finish it today, otherwise, you know, we will finish it next week. But this would be kind of the last two. And then what I will do is I will frame quest, uh, three assessments based on all that we've covered and put it online. And you can use the, uh, uh, you know, the remaining two, three weeks to just answer those, uh, do those assessments. Uh, they won't be very difficult. Uh, you know, pretty much it's an open book assessment, so you can just it's, it'll be like a revision of everything we've covered. So you go through everything, answer this question. So you'll be doing the assessment, but also it'll be like a full revision of uh, the entire course, right? So let's get into this last lesson, which is having to deal with social issues. I'm going to share the PDF. And um, why why is it important even to be concerned you know about these social issues a uh, lot of things are going on in the world today uh, why should we as believers uh, even be bothered about it well one big reason is because first timothy 316 the apostle paul taught us that the church is the pillar of truth, First Timothy, chapter three, and uh, sorry, it's verse fifteen. I made a mistake here. It's verse fifteen, not verse sixteen. First Timothy three fifteen. He says, uh, "If I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth." So he says the church of the living God, the church. And of course, in this context, he's writing to the local church in Ephesians. But it, of course, applies to every local church. It applies to the church as a whole. The church is the pillar and ground. The pillar means the upholder. You can think of a pillar as an upholder. Ground means foundation of truth. So, truth in this world is going to be upheld and it's going to be the foundation for that is the church meaning the church is the upholder of truth and it's the supporter a foundational supporter and upholder of truth in this world if the church is taken out of the way then truth in this world can easily be distorted compromised there is no there is no other upholder and foundation supporter of truth in this world god has placed the church in this world as the upholder and supporter of truth so from that perspective the church meaning believers you and i we have to uphold truth 
even regarding all these social matters you know there will be uh, uh, questions uh, on, on all of these social issues sometimes there will be even spiritual issues and legislative issues like government and law and so on and uh, the church has to say this is the truth now whether other people accept it or not we can't force that we can't force everybody to accept the truth it's their choice but we should be a voice of truth a voice for truth in this world and say this is the truth this is what the word god word of god says this is what god wants and then you know there will be people who agree there will be people who disagree and we still love the people even if they disagree okay we respect them love them but this is the truth and so in relation to that there are other questions uh, you know how can the church be engaged in the world uh, when it comes to especially legislative matters that means laws that are being you know uh, established in countries so you have the legislative part of government and they are making up rules so they're making up laws and uh, you know if the law that is being made by the government is in some way wrong morally wrong or uh, in uh, is against truth you know how what should the church do and how do we relate to all of this and that's a big issue it's a big area to think about i'm not saying we have all the answers but we need to think we need to pray we need to study and we need to see how to respond to these kinds of things so you know can moral issues can spiritual issues be legalized or legislated you know can law control moral behavior can law should law affect spiritual expression a lot of things going on different parts of the world different countries are having their own challenges and own struggles you know and uh, we can speak for what's happening here in india if you know what's happening you know, all kinds of things uh, and and uh, other parts of the world other countries will have their own challenges so what i want to present first of all to us is we should have a little framework we should have a framework to guide our thinking that means look this is how we should look at the situation and we should base our framework on you know to Im uh, base based on imitating god you know how does god deal with sinners meaning how does god deal with people who don't know him who are not necessarily respectful of him or fearful of him how does god deal with such people and we have to imitate god because we are also dealing with the same people right people who don't know god or may not even have the fear of god and uh, we have to relate to them and the good thing to do is imitate god in how he relates to those who are sinners who don't know god so here are some here are five things i've put down to keep us uh, to guide our thinking one is god does not override human will that means god doesn't for you know god is king god is judge god is all powerful but he doesn't force people to follow him he tells them of course he so number 2 he expresses what is right and wrong. He tells them, see, this is right, this is wrong. This path will lead to destruction. This path will lead to life and blessing. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says. God says, you know, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. But choose life. 
That's what God says. So he says, look, there are two paths in front of you. One that leads to life and blessing, one that leads to that death and cursing. But God is telling us, choose life. So he's telling us what's right and wrong. He's telling us, you know, what would be the right choice. But he leaves that choice to us. He doesn't override human will. He doesn't control us, manipulate us, or anything like that. But he tells us very clearly, right, wrong. These are the consequences. You make your choice. We also see in the Bible that God is willing to reason together. You know, so in Isaiah and both these scriptures, in Isaiah, he says, come, let us reason together. I mean, let's, in other, way, in other words, okay, you have questions, I will answer. Let's reason together. So that's another thing we can imitate God. And that means we are willing to dialogue. We are willing to listen to the other side as well as respond to the other side. Right? Two people have a different idea, different thought. Let's reason together. So we are not afraid of discussion or sharing thoughts and so on. The other thing we see in scripture is God treats everyone with love and fairness, even those who are against him. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, you know, look at your heavenly father. He makes the sun to shine on the good and the evil. He makes the rain to fall on the good and the evil. In other words, God doesn't say, well, just because you're evil, no sunlight for you and no rain for you. No, he's loving, he's fair. Yes, there are people who are disobedient. Yes, there are people who don't fear God, who may be in sin, whatever. But his goodness, his providence is extended to everybody. He's, you know, he's, he's good and fair to everybody. And yet, number five, God does not compromise himself. That means he will never go against himself. He is truth. He is holy. He is just and he's love. And he won't compromise these things. That means just because he loves the sinner, he's not going to change and say, sin is okay. No. Sin is still sin. But he loves the sinner. He loves the person. But sin is still sin. What is holy is holy. What is unholy is unholy. God will not change that. He will not compromise that. He will not compromise truth or holiness or justice or love. So these five thoughts can give us a little framework, can give us a framework based on which we can respond to some of the challenges that we would face. So people come and ask us questions about this, about that. You know, yeah, you know, we can tell them this is right and this is wrong. We're not going to force you to make the choice. That choice is yours. You have a free will. We are willing to sit down and reason. We're willing to listen to what you have to say lovingly, peacefully. We don't have to fight. And we will, you know, whatever rules are made or whatever we do, we will be loving and fair, but we cannot compromise ourselves. We can, cannot compromise who we are. We will continue to be who we are, even if you do not, you know, even regardless of what the other side says. We will continue to walk in truth, holiness, justice, and love. So those are things we want to compromise on. So with that framework, let's move forward to think about another issue is, you know, there are many things the Bible is silent about. That means we cannot give a chapter and verse about that. And we will look at some of these things. For example, you know, genetics or organ transplant. So you, you can't give a chapter in verse that says genetics is right or genetics is wrong. I mean, especially when you want to uh, use the science of genetics to modify the genes, the genetic makeup of you know fruits or animals, and then even human beings, you know, for various things. And we will talk about it. Or organ transplant, you're taking the organ from one human person, putting it in another human person to fix a problem. Or, you know, then there's this whole issue of surrogacy, of somebody else bearing 
the child of somebody else. I mean, you know, this is such a you don't you don't find chapter and verse on this, and how do you respond to something like this? You know, but this is becoming so. Things like these are becoming more and more prevalent, and then you know. What does the church say about these things? What does the Bible say? How are we to respond to these? And then there are other matters, you know. So, how do we respond to topics where we don't find a clear chapter and verse? You know, well, here's some guidelines. Uh, we can arrive at a conclusion or a decision based on three things. One is the nature of God. Always start with God Himself. You know, what is the nature and the character of God? Who who is God in relation to this matter? You know, what is the nature of God in relation to this matter? What can be uh, the, about the nature and the character of God? What part of it can we bring to bear on this matter? First thought. Second, okay, there may not be a specific chapter and verse, but generally, what do we understand from scripture? From what is written, what can we understand? Right? That's the second one. And the third one is what would be just, fair, right, and good? That means we want to stay in harmony with the fact that God is just, God is fair, He's good. Right, so again, bring that to bear on the matter. And keeping these in mind, we try to think about the map issue, the topic, and then arrive at a conclusion. But again, in such places, in such matters where we don't have a specific chapter and verse, uh, it is good to say that this is my opinion, meaning this is not chapter and verse. You know, this is a decision or a conclusion that I've arrived at based on some of my thinking, which is I've tried to understand the nature of God, I've tried to look at scripture, I've tried to be just very good, and therefore I've arrived at this conclusion. Right? So we always say it's my opinion. It's not like this is thus saith God. No. Especially when there is no specific chapter in verse. We don't want to insist on our own conclusion. Now, this is a conclusion I, I've arrived at. Somebody else may try to go through the same thought process, and they may arrive at a different conclusion. It's okay. They may have given more weight or more emphasis to a certain aspect of who God is, or a certain general instruction in Scripture, or maybe a certain other understanding. Fine. And we can't argue, especially on matters where the Bible is silent, okay, we can't fight on it. We don't want to fight on it. We can express our opinion and leave it at that. right? But when there is chapter and verse, and when the Bible is very clear, and the Bible has spoken about a matter, then we need to say that very clearly. I'm just giving a guideline on when the Bible is silent on certain topics. All right, so let's pick up, you know, uh, some topics, and then I'll, of course, open up for question answers, and we can, you know, we can definitely discuss. Now, now when it comes to this whole issue of marriage, homosexuality, and sex, same-sex marriage, I've clubbed all these together because they're all interrelated in some way. Uh, you know, we we start off the topic of marriage, and then. In the world today, and then you know, in the world today, what has happened is homosexuality, a sexual lifestyle, came into the forefront. It's all it has always been there from Bible times. But it became like homosexuality had to be, you know, came into the forefront as though it was a normal way of life. And then that st stepped into this whole thing of well. If this is accepted as a normal way of life, then uh, we should give provision for same-sex marriage. So, you know, 
two people of the same gender want to get married they want to have a family meaning they'll adopt children or whatever and have uh, so have a family so things have become very complicated now God created marriage he created male and female very clearly and then somehow all of that got distorted and then there was sex between people of the same gender that became accepted as normal I'm talking about the world the world began to give that expression and then that moved into impacting marriage itself you know so it's like we've gone through a full circle and corrupted not only sexuality but we ended up corrupting the ordinance of marriage itself and, and so they're all interconnected now the Bible is very clear on this topic right so we have clear statements in the Word of God on this matter right so we know starting from Genesis chapter 2 chapter 2 verse 24 God designed marriage always to be between one man one woman so that is very clear Right. So man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Right. It was very clear. So there's no same-sex marriage in the Bible. It's not there. And we also know the Bible calls homosexuality or sex between people of the same gender as sin. Uh, there are several places, Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, Re even Revelation chapter 20, several scriptures where uh, homosexuality is sin, it, it, it's judged by God. And we believe that because it is sin, as, as with other kinds of sins, God sets people free God can you know God can touch the hearts and lives of people and set people free from this sin just as he sets people free from sets us free from other kinds of sins so we shouldn't exclude homosexuality he sets people free from all kinds of sin so we believe that we know that we pray for that now the world is opposed to us saying homosexuality is sin, but we can't compromise the truth. The world is opposed to us saying that people can be set free from this lifestyle, but we can't compromise the truth. And so what do we do? We, and yet we have to walk in love. So just as we say God loves the sin, God hates sin, but he loves the sinner, we too we call sin a sin, but we love the people who may be trapped in this kind of lifestyle and to whatever extent they are willing to be open, we will love them, serve them, minister to them, pray for them to be set free uh, by the power of God and so on. Now, if some people don't want to be set free, then we can't force it. We don't uh, overwrite uh, this. And then when we also are willing to sit down and listen to the other side. So there are people who will argue. You know, they'll say, well, I was born like this. Or um, these feelings are natural to me. Sometimes people have tried to even say, well, this is in, 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 in our genes. And, and it has been proved. And I think this there was a study from Johns Hopkins University to, to show that uh, uh, homos th these tendencies or same-sex uh, homosexual tendencies I don't have anything in the genes uh, they put out a study quite some time back but anyway there will be these kinds of arguments from the other side saying oh I was born like this I have these tendencies I have these feelings I was born as a man but then I later discovered I, I, I really was supposed to be a woman or the other way I was born as a woman but I realized I was supposed to be a man whatever they'll have all these arguments you know we will listen 
uh, we are not, uh, we, we don't just shut our ears. Okay, fine. We will reason together. All right. You say what you have to say, and we will provide an honest response to the arguments. Right. So we are imitating God in how we relate to people uh, on this matter. So to sum it up, this is a matter where the Bible is very clear. Marriage is for a man and a woman, not for people of the same gender. So we cannot support that. Second, homosexuality, a uh, sexual expression of people within the same gender, is wrong. And this complicated thing of same-sex marriage is also wrong because it goes against what the Bible clearly states. And we also believe that just as in every other situation, God can set people free from this. He can set us free. So we pray. We pray for minister, pray for deliverance, we pray for minister, uh, people to be ministered to. We believe that. And yet having understanding and standing for the truth, we also walk in love. We love the people. We're willing to listen to them. And we are willing to share in an honest way. This is what the truth is. Now, having said that, there are difficult situations in life, meaning uh, here are things that have happened. You know, um, for example, if you are a business owner, and th these are real situations that have happened. You know, uh, so here's a person who's a believer who's running a bakery, and a gay couple come and order a cake. They say, "Please make a cake for us. Uh, we are having our wedding, so make a wedding cake for us." So there's a gay couple, and they're placing an order for a wedding cake in this bakery, where the owner or the person running the bakery is a believer and doesn't believe in, you know, doesn't support on same-sex marriage. So what do you do in a situation like this? You know, he can make a cake, he can make any cake, of course, but when he has been told that this is a cake for a gay couple, and he doesn't believe in a, gay ma in a, in a, in a same-sex marriage, you know, he can't put, you know, happy wedding and put the names of two men or two women on the cake. He can't do that. So what should he do? Right? Now, in some places, a business owner has a right to refuse service. He says, sorry, uh, I, 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 my, my faith doesn't allow me to do that. I cannot make this cake. Uh, you know, they, they can go, the, the couple can go to another shop and get it done. So there may be, a, you know, a bakery next door who's willing to do it. That's, that's their choice. But for this business owner, he can refuse to do it because of his faith. But that became a big legal issue because how can you refuse a service based on other, you know, meaning the gay couple is questioning? How can you refuse making us a cake just because you don't agree with our, what we're doing? So that became a big legal issue. Uh, I think, I mean, I don't, I haven't been following the whole uh, result of story, but uh, I think the end result was that uh, the the legal court, the court, the Supreme Court supported the person of faith, saying, "Yeah, he has a right to refuse service based on his belief." But that may not be the same everywhere, all over the world. There could be situations where, you know, they pass a law saying, "Well, you cannot, you have no right to refuse service based on." Faith, you know, that's a very difficult situation. Yeah. But this is where the legal side comes into effect, the running of a business, you know, and when faith comes in, the law comes in, 
you're running a business, what do you do? Very difficult situation. Right? Or you think about some other situations. You know, if you are the HR manager in a company, and uh, whatever company, IT company, different different companies, and in the company they want to have a culture where they want to be inclusive. We so we don't have we don't discriminate against people against their sexual orientation. So that is being fair. They want to be fair to everybody. You know what you do in your personal life. That's your choice. When you come to the organization, you do your job. You do your work. You know, if you're a software developer, you come and you do your software work. What you do, your sexual orientation, your marital status, that is your personal is issue. So we will not even discriminate or we won't even take that into consideration. So that's the organization, which is, I think, you know, it's, it's a fair thing, meaning the reason this organization is existing to do a certain kind of business, whatever, whether IT or healthcare, education, whatever they may be, as long as a person is able to do their work, that's all. They're hiring the person to do the work. What race that person belongs to, or what is whether they're married or unmarried or whatever, that is not a consideration as far as the work is concerned. And so they want to have policies, organizational policies that are drafted to express that, right? So as a human resource person or a HR or a cultural office person, you will have to be fair to everybody. But here becomes the problem, or here comes the problem. And in many organizations, globally, the people of you know, example, like, you know, they have a gay pride month or, uh, you know, these are things that are being celebrated, quote unquote, recognized in the world. And they want that to be expressed within the organization. I mean, as example, if there is a cultural festival, some festival happening, that is usually also expressed within the organization. And so then this becomes an issue. Okay, gay pride, we want the organization to celebrate that. So it becomes a very difficult situation because we understand fairness in employment. It means you, you know, what your orientation is, we're not worried you, as long as you do the job. But there's the other aspect where the celebration of various things that happen in culture spill over into the organization, then the HR person has to organize, you know, some event, something to celebrate that. Example, a gay pride month or something like that. That becomes a very, it puts that HR person in a difficult position, especially if that's not aligned to the, you know, when it's not aligned to the faith. Imagine a Christian, a believer, having to organize something that celebrates gay pride. It's against his personal faith, but because he's in the organization, you know, he has to do those things. And that becomes very difficult. I'm talking about that particular thing, you know. Or if you're in government, you're in a, you know, you're a chief minister, you're a prime minister, whatever. You're, you're in government, and then you've got to relate to people of all backgrounds. And today, people you know of the same sex and or all these things. You know, how do you treat everybody fairly, equally? How do you make the sun to shine on both the good and the evil, give rain to good and evil? You know, just like how God is doing in your own jurisdiction. How do you treat everybody equally and fairly so that whatever you do as a leader uh, you know, in government, you're being fair to everybody? That, again, is a tiff, tough question. And then lastly, the local church. You know, can the local church refuse to conduct gay marriages? And we have, you know, for example, we've taken a clear stand. We will not do it. You know why? Because the Bible is very clear. And the church stands by the word of God. The church preaches and teaches the word of God. So we will not conduct these marriages. 
Now, that doesn't mean they cannot go and get married. They can go and register their marriage in, in a government office and get married. That's up to them. But as far as the church is concerned, we will not conduct uh, gay marriage. We take that stand very clearly. So in some situations, like the church, we can take a very clear stand. But then there are other difficult situations, you know, in the workplace or in government, where you have to be fair to everybody regardless of their you know personal matters uh, how do you do these things is is quite a challenge okay so let me pause here and I've, we've covered a lot of ground let me pause here and see you know if there are any questions for discussion um, uh, and let's let's uh, look into that all right um, any questions on this? Um, let's let's. Um, okay, I see uh, a question from Paul Evoto. He says, "I'm using local brew residues to feed my poultry. Uh, is this right?" Uh, you know. So here's a matter where there is no chapter and verse. To answer this question, so what we have to do is uh, we have to just think through on this and arrive at a conclusion, something that would be, uh, and, and of course we would express it as an opinion. This is what we think it is or we feel, um, but there's no chapter and verse we can give, but we arrive at a best decision that we can. So let me open this up to the class. Here's a question from Paul. He's looking, he's using the residue, so that means the leftover. So he's not using the alcohol, but he's using the leftover from, you know, so they would maybe example, whether it's rice or something else. Um, uh, uh, you know, they are using, he's using that to feed chicken. Uh, let's see what the class thinks. What do you think? I mean, so there's no chapter and verse on this. So we're not giving you know a definite answer. We just we're trying to uh, arrive at a conclusion, a, a decision. What do you think? You know, you're just feeding the poultry with the leftovers uh, from some you know some grain product that the grains may be used to generate alcohol. So he's not feeding the alcohol. He's using the leftover to feed the poultry. Is it okay? Is the question. Feel free to share your thoughts on that. Okay, I see one response. Others? I'm looking at the chat. So one, Arthi says, I think it's okay. Anyone else? John Paul says, I think it's okay. Collins, I think it's okay, uh, as long as his conscience is fine. Uh, Collins says that, nice. Uh, Elisha, you want to share your thoughts? Yes, uh, Pastor, I think uh, there's no problem with it. It is okay uh, since mm. what he's using is a residue one, and uh, this is not something he is taking in to destroy his body mm. uh, it is being used uh, as a feed for his animals mm. which is a commercial activity so mm. uh, i believe that his conscience should be clear about it he shouldn't carry any guilt mm. it is okay just as a farmer who goes to the field and plow the field to make it more efficient mm -hmm. that's my, my opinion good thank you Thank you for sharing. I see others, other response as well. Subhashir says, I think it's okay. Zalatoli, I think it's okay. Um, Abu Bakre, I think it's okay. Yeah. And uh, I will join my word as well. And I, I also think it's okay. Right? So, so here is an, a clear example where we don't have a chapter and verse for this. But it is, you know, a genuine question. You know, is it the right thing to do or not? And so we 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 look at it and say, look, you know, we, and I think most of you would have gone through the same thought process that 
uh, Elisha shared that uh, it is not affecting the person. He is, you know, it's not like, for example, if I, I was getting drunk or so on, uh, you know, if it's making me drunk or do something sinful, then of course it would be not right before God. So it's not affecting any human person. And uh, it is not harming the the poultry, you're just feeding them. And, uh, you know, so it's perfectly fine. The, 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 the grain products may have been used to generate alcohol, but you're not feeding the alcohol to the birds, you're feeding the residue, which, you know, this is what some sort of food for them. So, you know, so we arrive at a simple conclusion like this, we think through it and say, yeah, there's nothing harmful being done. So it should be okay. And, you know, as long as your conscience is clear, like if some people have said, yeah, go ahead with it, you know. So here's an, ex that's a good example. Let's take another one here, uh, Arti shares, uh, in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. Uh, by refusing to accept the gay couple's order, would it be looked upon as the believer cake shop owner did not show the love of Christ to these people just because they were homosexuals? You know, and that is a very interesting question, right? So let's think about this, right? So here's a person who has a bakery. A gay couple comes, they say, hey, we're going to get married, you know, one week from now or two, whatever, two weeks from now. Example, let's say two men come, right? they come to this shop and uh, uh, and they tell them, hey, we, you know, two men are there uh, and uh, they're saying, hey, we're going to get married two weeks from now, we want to place a order for a cake uh, and on the cake you should write, what, you know, we just like to say happy wedding or, and, you know, the names of the two men, whatever, and they want to place the order. now. The person owning the bakery is a believer. At that moment, okay, I mean, he's happy to make cakes, but at that moment, you know, he's in a dilemma. Making a cake is fine. The cake is itself is a neutral thing. It's a, it's just food. But I'm, 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 I'm saying okay to. A gay marriage. I'm uh, giving it. Uh, I'm making it for these people. Now, try to imagine. Put yourself in the position of that person, and 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 think about the options in front of him. One is he could look at it as purely a business transaction. You know, I'll make a cake. I'll sell it to you. You pay me the money. What you do with it is up to you. I'm not interested. So he could look at it as purely a business transaction. And, you know, I will write whatever you tell me to write on it. I don't care, you know, happy wedding and the names of two men or whatever. So he could look at it as purely a business transaction. And he says, I am not guilty or I'm not responsible for what you do with the cake. If you use a cake to celebrate a gay wedding, that's your choice. It's not mine. I'm only making a cake. So he can look at it purely as a business transaction. Another thought was, another thought is, I don't agree with a gay marriage, but I am not participating in that marriage, meaning I'm not going there, I'm not attending the wedding, I'm not conducting the wedding, and uh, I don't agree with the marriage with the gay marriage but that is but i love these two people meaning they are people the fact that they want to get married is their choice i i'm not the one who's telling them to get married i don't agree with that i'm not attending the wedding i'm not blessing the wedding i love them as people and so I'll make the cake give it to them and pray for their salvation or pray that they will come to know the truth or something so that could be another thought process I'm just I'm just trying to imagine you know as a baker and that moment what are the things that options that would have come through his mind so that this could be uh, could have been another option 
where I don't agree, but I'm not involved, and I will love these people, I will serve them by making them a cake. That could be a second option. A third option is the position that this particular person took, which is, I don't agree with a gay marriage. I will not let, I will not participate in it, participate in it in any way. I will not make a cake for them. Right? So this, there practically, I can think of three options. One is do it purely as a commercial transaction. Second, you don't agree, but you, because of love, you do it. Third, you say, I don't agree. I love them, but um, I love them, but I cannot do this because it's against my faith. Three things. So think about it. You know, we'll go for a break. Just think about it. And, you know, let's take your thoughts on this. Uh, you know, what, 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 what would have been the right thing to do? You know, what would be, you know, if you look at our framework, the first five points we gave, based on that, what could have been acceptable decisions by the baker, the person who owns the bakery, in a situation like this? Okay, so we'll be back in about 10 minutes and then let's uh, discuss on this. And let's try to use our framework of these five points and, and, and try to arrive at some decision. Okay, all right, let's go for a break. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 